I I'm, feel very uh, moved to be able to uh, introduce to you this evening our distinguished guest, uh, Jacques Vallée. He has an amazing uh, reputation and an amazing history, and uh, we'll be able to enjoy some of that this evening. I've heard his name, uh, oh, for years and years and years, long before I ever met him, or before I knew about his connection with remote viewing. And when I was researching my book, I happened to be talking to Ingo Swan, and Ingo said, uh, I said, how did you come to the idea of uh, using coordinates? He said, oh, that was Jacques Vallée. I said, Jacques Vallée? Is, wasn't he in that movie? <laughs> no, he wasn't in the movie, but he was the inspiration for the, uh, the French scientist in Close Encounters, many of you are probably aware. Well, Dr. Vallée's accomplishments are, are, are many and varied. Um, unlike Al Gore, he really did invent the Internet. He actually was he was one of the uh, one of the uh, important actors back in the old ARPA days when they were first putting what became the internet together. He's uh, been a computer scientist for for many many years and uh, a pioneer in the field. What's of course uh, interesting to us is his involvement in the remote viewing program. Uh, I had no aware I was had little awareness of how involved he was even after Ingo Swan told me about the his. Uh, his uh, suggestion of using coordinates. Uh, but he has had some attachment to it, the scientific side of it, for many, many years. He uh, was trained by Ingo Swan, some of the early protocols. Um, he was an advisor to Hal and Ingo and uh, Russell while they were working on the, in the research uh, at SRI. Uh, he worked with Ed May and some of the uh, research that he was working on as an advisor. And so he's had kind of his, his finger in the remote viewing pie all the way up to fairly recent times. Uh, he's going to share some of that with us. Of course, many of you know, because of his interest in, as he likes to characterize it, unexplained aerial phenomena. Um, and that, of course, that's where I knew about him from until I uh, talked to Ingo Swan about this. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about remote viewing. Uh, he may touch on the other stuff. I don't know. Uh, exactly where he's going to go. He is welcome to go anywhere he wants. But uh, we're very uh, very pleased to have him. We're very excited to hear from him. And so let me bring up Dr. Jacques Vallée. Thank you. Thank you very much. So th this may be a test of uh, concentration of, con of your consciousness. I think this was designed, in fact, by Paul and uh, to have uh, the music and to see how distracted you might be by having conflicting uh, messages tonight. But hopefully they'll be quiet enough that we can, we can turn this into a general discussion. Because as you know, um, I'm not a, uh, I don't consider myself a parapsychology researcher. I've done some research. I've been very interested in the field for many, many years. As you will see, I have been involved in various times significantly in some programs, but I really don't consider myself in the class of people who do, uh, who do the scientific research on, on parapsychology. Uh, so I'm an outsider, uh, but an outsider has a, you know, a, a privileged position because first, I, I don't have an ax to grind, I don't have a personal theory or personal hypothesis, so uh, I'm more free to raise some questions that might or might not be raised in the normal course of, of the professional uh, discourse. The, um, and I should say also by way of introduction, it's a real pleasure to become re reunited, reacquainted with many of you who, whom I've met over the years, over the last 20 or 30 years even, uh, in this context. So um, the... I first became involved in, uh, I, I've always been interested in parapsychology even when I, when I grew up in, in France. As you may know, there was a, a lot of research done in France at the turn of the previous century in parapsychology, including research on remote viewing. There is an organization in France called the uh, Institut Métapsychique that had done uh, some very advanced uh, remote viewing experiments. Um, and I had read all that stuff. And when I came to California in the um, late 60s, early 70s, I uh, joined a group in uh, Palo Alto called the, Palo the Parapsychology Research Group. 
And those people were mostly people from Stanford, psychologists, um, scientists, who were interested in exploring generally the psychic field. Can I have the next slide, please? And the, uh, that group met at a remarkable place. There was a, one, one of the leaders was a professor of architecture at Stanford who had built his house on the San Andreas Fault. Most people in California try to buy, their, to, to buy a house or build a house away from the major fault. He thought what the, the, the fault is about one mile wide of essentially gravel, you know, of rock that has been over the centuries. So he put a railroad um, uh, you know, steel down in the, in the fault and built a, a very beautiful A-frame redwood house on, on top of that. And it was probably the safest place where you would want to be if there was an earthquake in California. And the, there was, so there was a lot of, of energy <laughs> flowing through that beautiful house. The, the main room was uh, almost the size of this room here. And uh, there were many, many wonderful meetings there. There was a creek that was running right around the, the, the house. And I've always remembered that, and that there were a number of, um, and Russell, I'm, I'm sure, remembers that, that house and those meetings. Um, there were a number of, of guests from many different countries who came there from uh, behind the, the Iron Curtain, from Europe, from other places, to discuss their experiments in psychic functioning. And so slowly there was a, a, a community of professionals who became interested in that. That community included two ph laser physicists, uh, Russell Targ and Hal Putoff. And that's where I really met them. And then I joined, um, I joined SRI, not to do remote viewing, but I joined SRI to work on one of the, uh, in one of the computer science labs. SRI had uh, engine number two on ARPANET. ARPANET is the prototype, was a prototype of the internet. They didn't, nobody knew that at the time. But uh, I don't need to tell you how many millions of computers there are now on the internet. Well, SRI had number two. And uh, that group was, was a very advanced group that developed a number of techniques. Um, and some of the techniques that are used today on the web uh, to link people together, to link documents together. They invented the mouse. Uh, everybody thinks that Apple invented the mouse because Steve Jobs stole it uh, from a lab who had stolen it from SRI. It wasn't stolen. I mean, it was in the public domain anyway. And Steve Jobs recognized the potential of the mouse that nobody else had recognized. But we had mice in 1970. And uh, we were using them in the, the context of that networking, big networking experiment we were building. And then uh, Russ and, and Hal uh, came to SRI to uh, start experimenting with psychic functioning. And this was really a turning point because the, up to then, most of the people who had done, and I, I was, again, looking at this as, a, as an observer, as, a, as an outsider, most of the people who had done parapsychology research were psychologists, which was, was natural. But it missed that scientific background, that scientific um, rigor that physicists could bring. And the turning point was here were two real hard physicists who were going to do tests in psychic functioning. They started with experiments, and, and uh, Russell can correct me uh, if I'm wrong, but the, the early work was done with private money. Um, Ed Mitchell, Captain Ed Mitchell, uh, brought some funding. There was some funding from the Navy. Uh, but there was no big program at that point. There was a patchwork of support that came from people who were very intrigued with, with the whole idea. And, uh, and it started showing results. But most of that was about the idea of, can we train people to be psychic? And there were ideas floating around about machines, training machines where you had to predict the next uh, state of the machine by pushing buttons, and, and the machine would record how you were doing and if you were making progress and so on. And then uh, Ingo Swan was brought in as, as a consultant, was brought in to, to SRI. Ingo lived in New York, but was brought into SRI under these programs. And the, the, the program sort of took shape, and the idea was 
what can we do in um, looking at remote location, but hey, you know, we're engineers and we're scientists. We'd like to look not just at remote locations, but to make it really useful, we'd like to look at equipment. Uh, can, we, can we look inside the lab somewhere and find out what's going on? Can we look at the structure of a machine somewhere? Uh, the, of course, the implications were not lost on the government and the, the three-letter agencies uh, were very interested in the potential intelligence applications of that, but it, from the beginning, it had a very technical context. So Ingo, um, Ingo was somewhat frustrated. He, was, he doesn't like California. Most people would love to. The all expenses paid in Menlo Park for two weeks and so on. Ingo didn't like that. He liked Manhattan, and he was uh, somewhat uncomfortable in California. And also, he was, he's an artist, and he was in an environment of uh, high-tech folks and engineers and computer geeks. And so he thought, I'm going to try to learn as much as I can about what these people do and understand that culture. So um, also, Ingo had an interest in aerial phenomena. And uh, so we started talking, and we became friends, and we would go out to, to lunch. I wasn't part of the experiments that they were doing, but I was in the same building. So it was easy for us to get together. And uh, over one of these uh, lunches, I asked Ingo, well, what is it exactly that you do? Because he, he was saying he was very frustrated with the training that they were trying to take him through, guessing the state of a machine and, and, and that type of thing. It reminded him of Zener cards, where you have to guess you know, the same cards again and again and again and again. And he was saying, this isn't what I do. So I asked him, well, what is it you do? And he said, I can move my consciousness in space and time. And I can get information. So information is something that I understand. Uh, at least I, as, you know, I'm an information scientist. Most of my career has been with information structures of one kind or another. So I, I took Ingo through a quick uh, briefing on how computer people get information. And there are a number of ways to, to get to information. The simplest one from the very early days of computers is that you'd have an instruction in the computer that would say fetch X, which is the information I want, and it's the contents of memory cell 567, and the computer goes to that address and finds the content. The content is 2023. Fine. So that's a direct direct addressing is the the, uh, the most obvious technique. Next, as computers became more sophisticated, and by the way, direct addressing is a way when you boot up your your PC. That's what it does. It has the particular location it's going to go to to get the first address, because it can't do anything else, and and it will build the system from there. So it's still obviously in use. However. In, in scientific programming and so on, you never quite know where the next bit of information is going to be located, and you have a way to get to it. And you get to it through an intermediate cell. So you might, indirect addressing is, again, this is very simple, very basic. You, the instruction says, fetch X, the contents of the memory cell, whose address is inside memory cell 567. And then the answer would be 23. But you, you'd go through this cell here, and this cell contains you, some other program has put the address of the real thing that you need. So you indirectly, you have one, one extra step. Next. I'm going you know, quickly through that, but it, it's you know, very basic programming. The, today, of course, databases have gotten so big that they are much bigger than the memory of the computer. So there is no way to have the information inside the computer. The information may be in, in uh, some information may be in physical computer memory, but most of it will be in external data banks, and some of it may be dispersed over an entire network. It could be over the entire internet. So, and you may not know where it is. So you have to essentially do virtual addressing because you have a virtual information space, which may be billions and billions of, of, uh, of addresses when you only have a few million addresses inside that particular part of your program. So you have to have a statistical way of finding it, and then there will be other programs that continue to generate information and putting it somewhere, 
with a statistical way of spreading it out there so that when you need it, you can go back and get it. Now we're getting closer to what consciousness does in, in remote viewing. So the, what I was telling Ingo was, if, if, if you, one of the interesting things to research would be if you can really get information with your consciousness at a distance, what is it? Do you go directly to the location? Do you go to a location that takes you to the actual location? Or is there some statistical thing that happens in your brain or in somewhere in mind space that gets you to the, to the data? Because, the, of course, in, in this whole process, the data could be corrupted along the way. So, again, in computer science, there are ways of reconstructing what actually happened, and there must be something similar for consciousness. So I thought that was one of the, and uh, Ingo derived, took that uh, insight into the idea of coordinate remote viewing, and that's why you know, he gave me the, the, the credit for that. But one of the things I want to go back to uh, you know, later in this talk is that that research has never been done. I mean, that is potentially, uh, I think, one of the pregnant areas of if we're trying to understand the process, uh, link it to uh, neurology at some point, which we should. Uh, I think those questions should reemerge at some point, and I'll explain why the research never really got to that. Next. Uh, at that point, um, uh, Russ, uh, Hal, and, and Ingo were really the, the uh, spearhead of, of the whole program. There were other people who were brought into the program, were tested, uh, people who claimed to be psychic, uh, people who had, people like Pat Price, who had uh, uh, their, their own personal uh, reputation in the field. And many of these people were also interested in UFOs, or unidentified aerial phenomena. Uh, many of them would say, well, one of the standard questions was, how did you become aware that you had this ability? And a certain percentage of them would answer, well, that, uh, I wasn't aware of it until I saw this light in the sky that did funny things. And so there was a link. We didn't know if it was purely anecdotal or if there was a real link. But uh, there was enough of that that um, Hal and, and, and Russ uh, regarded me as, as sort of a friend of the court, even though I was not in the program. Um, but I was in the next building, and I was available to come talk to people and, and, and to follow that. So that's how I became involved as, a, as an innocent bystander uh, who had joint interest with them, and they also knew that I was at SRI and, and that I could keep my mouth shut. I wasn't going to talk to you know, the media about what was, what was going on, because at that point, it was SRI took a very serious risk. SRI is a, a great academic research institution, works for uh, the, you know, the, uh, the top you know, uh, fortune, 500 companies in the US developing very advanced technology. And the, uh, at one time, the head of the lab, the head of the department, came into my office and, and closed the door. And he, um, he said, I need to talk to you about what's going on with the psychic program. And he said, I'm, I'm asking your advice because you managed to do some research that was controversial research in other areas with your reputation intact. And uh, we need to learn to do that because there are some very, very funny things going on in the psychic program. Now, all these people who claim to be psychic, but he drew, so he drew something on my blackboard which was a scale with uh, a few hundred million dollars of research over here as a big block. And on this side, the psychic research program, which might, if everything went well, might be a million dollars of research for SRI. And the question was, should we jeopardize those hundreds of million, millions of dollars of real scientific research? You know, SRI has developed breakthroughs in, in aerospace, breakthroughs in radio, uh, breakthroughs in uh, train transportation. The, uh, the brakes on the, the big locomotives were developed at SRI. The, uh, 
a lot of the electrostatic dispersion systems on the wings of airliners were developed at SRI. I mean, this is heavy duty uh, you know, scientific development. Should we um, uh, compromise that with a psychic program that may turn out to be viewed as a flaky thing by, uh, by the rest of the community? And so the, we, we had that discussion and my feeling was um, SRI has that reputation because we take risk. And this is a risk we should take. This is potentially very important. Um, it's, you know, there were many people researching interface between consciousness and computers, for example, with DARPA funding. There were, I mean, the, the whole idea of consciousness and its role in physics and its role in equipment, I think, was, you know, is, is, is very important. So that, um, that challenge was there, and I thought SRI should take that challenge. However, a lot of the funding was going to come from classified, um, classified agencies. And that posed another question, which is, if we do this classified research, then what good does it do to the rest of the community? Because people are not going to find out about it. So I, I wrote him a memo on, that has never been published, but on the balance between classified and unclassified research. Because this research would never have been funded by National Science Foundation or by anybody else in the normal academic community. And the, the advantage of having uh, classified funding was that you could be, you could have a protection for the, the, the research long enough to get to results that could eventually be published and, and could be made available to the community at large. So that was, um, no, gave me some insight in, and, and SRI accepted the challenge. You know, I, I'm sure they spoke to a lot of other people, but they, they had the guts to actually go, go ahead and support the program. Next. So um, I want to, in the meantime, I, I left SRI. I took over two programs from a man named Paul Barron. We were joking earlier about who invented the, the internet, and there are many fathers of the internet, but there is only one grandfather, and that's Paul Barron. Paul Barron is a very quiet, you probably have never seen his name, probably never seen him on television. He was the engineer at the Rand Corporation in 1965 who invented packet switching. And packet switching is a technique by which data moves around the internet. Uh, of course, it was in the public domain, so he never made a dollar out of that, that invention. But he, he invented, he was the, the real father of, of the ARPANET, did not want to run the ARPANET, but at, uh, in about 74, 70, actually about 73, um, he left academic research to start a career as an entrepreneur. And he started building a number of companies that today are on, uh, on NASDAQ. He, uh, and he, le he had started two projects on, in networking on how to link groups of people through computers. Up to then, computers had been linked together to do computation, which is, you know, was a normal, a normal thing to do. But we thought there was much more potential in linking people and computation together through computer networks. Uh, the ARPANET at the time was about 52 computers all over the world. Well, not all over the world, but in US, Canada, and, and, and Western Europe. And uh, we started building conferencing systems that would tie experts together in various fields. And we started observing, because we were the first ones to do that, so my project developed the first network conferencing system. And we were observing groups of people uh, interacting through computers, and we were beginning to observe some very interesting thing. These people were very frustrated because they wanted to communicate with lots of people very quickly, but they only had a keyboard. So th they had, essentially, there was a psychic component on top uh, that we could observe on top of the typed communication. But we could also capture everything else. And our system was a system that married um, electronic mail, the way you know it today, uh, instant messaging, and a couple of other, other features that could be done together simultaneously. 
So you could have electronic mail with a delay, you could have electronic mail with no delay, and you could have instant messaging and private messages, which doesn't exist on the web today. So we, we had a really exceptional system at that point that we were doing research on. And in analyzing the transcripts, we would find strange things. For example, we would find people answering a question before the question was asked. So somebody in, you know, somebody in Chicago would say, uh, hey, uh, you know, there is uh, this kind of research has been going on in biology, and I think you guys should look at it. And then uh, 10 seconds later, there was a message which was already in the system when the first one was typed that said, by the way, is there research in biology that would relate to this? Okay, so we would find those, those coincidences and they came more and more. And people described having, almost be, not being out of their body, but being a, a sense of community when they were sharing the computer space with these other people. So we, we wrote an article called Computer Conferencing, a, uh, an Altered State of Communication with Dr. Arthur Hastings, who is now at uh, the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in, in, in Palo Alto. And it was sort of a seminal article. And a few people read that and said, you know, you guys should really explore that. See if there is a psychic enhancement that's done by, that's created by the ambience, by the atmosphere of computer conferencing, by depriving people of the normal channels of communication where they can't see each other, they can't touch each other, they have to communicate through this lousy keyboard. So um, when, uh, there was a, one television executive in San Francisco who uh, said he was willing to finance a special conference to do that. In the meantime, we had moved our system away from government networks. We had moved it to TimeNet, which was a timeshare network, a network of the timeshare corporation. So we had, we had a completely commercial system. We could do whatever we wanted on that commercial system, and the time was being paid for. So uh, we designed a, a series of psychic experiments on the network, which was the first time that had been done. We selected 12 participants. Ingo was one of them. We gave him a terminal in Manhattan. Uh, Hal was, was a participant. Brendan O'Regan, whose name is still current in a lot of the early psychic research, uh, was a participant. Uh, Richard Back, the author of Jonathan Livingston Seagull, was very interested in this. We gave him a terminal in Florida. And uh, so we, have 12, we had 12 participants who were trained in using the network. And then um, there were scientists from the Institute for the Future where, where I was working, where I was doing this research. And so we started this conference on current issues in psychic research. People could come into the conference at any time. They could chat. They could talk about their research. They could file. They could send files into the system. Uh, and they could talk about ongoing stuff. But on top of that, we put a series of experiments. And I didn't want to redo the kind of experiments that were going on at SRI. I wanted to test something else. And in my computer career, I had done a lot of um, database development, data, generalized database systems, including some systems that the USGS was using, so the geology department at, uh, at Stanford. <coughs> Excuse me. And the, uh, I had friends at the US Geological Survey. I think it would be helpful if we could. Can, can you hear what I'm saying, or am I? OK. I think Paul is going to try to quiet them down a little bit. We, um, uh, so I, I went to my, my geology friends. And I said, we're going to do some experiments with people who think they can describe something at a distance. I want you to give me a series of samples of rocks that are unique, rocks that all have something special. And you know, geologists have, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I accumulate books. I have lots of books in, uh, on shelves. Geologists have lots of rocks. You go to their house, and there are all these bookshelves filled with rocks. And, and you know, a rock to me just looks like another rock, but to them, oh, no, no, this is the rock that I picked up in Alaska and so on. 
So um, we, they came up, we, we selected together a series of, of rock samples, and then we would use that as targets. And then we did two series of experiments in, in a fairly rigid, in a very rigid way at, at the, from the Institute for the Future. The, all the rocks were randomized. They were in, in double envelopes. So nobody knew which rock was where. They were all about the same weight. So you couldn't tell by looking at the envelope or, or lifting the envelope. The, uh, every morning, anybody on the network could describe, could come in and describe the rock that was at a particular location in that particular envelope, which was the envelope of the day. And then, so anytime during the day, they could come in and describe that rock. Then in the morning and the afternoon, the geologist friend would come in, open one of the envelopes, and hold the rock. And then people had something like half an hour to come in at that point with what today would be called instant messaging and describe what he was holding. So we had one that was true remote viewing. You had another one that you could say was telepathic, because if you could read the mind of the geologist holding the rock, you might have access to it. Again, I was trying to see what kind of addressing we could if we could begin to map out that space. We had two hypotheses. Does the network create an altered state of communication that enhances uh, psychic functioning? And can you provide recording of events while preventing collusion or subliminal cueing? Because there, these people were thousands of miles away. There was no way they could see what was going on in those envelopes. They had no access to the envelope. It was truly. And you could, of course, every message had a date and time stamp in seconds. So we could, we could tell you know, who was talking to whom and where they were. So there was no collusion. There was, uh, next. So this is essentially what, what the protocol was. And that's what I just described. Let me show you what the, the rocks were. I mean, this doesn't look like a very interesting rock, but it's it can come only from one place on Earth. It comes from Death Valley. It's a sample of basnosite and europium. It comes from one particular mine. Uh, and we asked the geologist to describe it ahead of time. So we had in the file, we had a description by a geologist. A somewhat flat angular fragment that is pale red, moderate pink, link brownish gray in color, composed of several non-metallic minerals and so on. So, we had a file on every single one of those before we started the experiment. Next. Another uh, sample. This is Cinnabar from Alaska. Um, again, with a description. And, and geologists have their own way of describing rocks and, and the, the morphology of the rocks and so on. So we wanted to see you know, how that would translate when we did the judging from the spontaneous description by the remote viewers. Next. So I'll go fairly quickly through that. This is magnetite. So it, even though it's just another rock, it's strongly magnetic. And we wanted to see if somebody would pick that up. Next. Uh, cobalt ore from, uh, from Alaska. We also wanted to see if people would locate where these came from. Next. Uh, Railgar from Utah. Next. And this is a quarter, so you can see the uh, opal. Um, next. Salt, pure salt crystal from Nevada. Um, galena, silver ore. And gold from um, the Madelode. And barite from uh, Dagway Proving Grounds. All of them were unusual in the description of the geologists. I mean, there, that was the idea was to, to have a, a range of unusual rock specimens. Then uh, we extracted transcripts from the conference. We retyped them in a uniform way so the judges couldn't tell you know, who, uh, you know, who had done it and so on. It was given to five judges, and I'll, I'll go fairly quickly through that who were asked to match the transcripts to the 10 targets, providing ranking of probabilities. And we, we tried to do that fairly. Uh, and the judges then had access to the samples 
and had access to the geological descriptions written ahead of time. Next. Well, I won't go through the whole uh, process, but it was, was a very eye-opening experience. Ingo um, remote viewed this and said, I have the impression I could look right through it. I wish it could keep still, crystal, crystal, crystal ball, glass, crystal, clear crystal. Target was soul crystal. Next. Um, this was Richard Back. Why do I keep getting greens? I see a medium-sized green wedge. Um, I don't see a pure emerald crystal much as I would like to. It is flecked and connected to a coarse rock edging. It looks to me like it was poured, a heavy liquid green plastic, the green becoming blue-green at the edges of the sample. And if fractured, it would be in one clean, smooth break of glassine purity. Uh, we had an, a number of those that were just direct hits uh, on, on the, the, those samples. The, uh, the actual target was assigned the highest score in eight of 33 cases. By chance, it would be one in 100. The overall statistical test gave, gave a, a p-value. But again, what we were looking for wasn't so much the statistics as the insight into the, into the process, into what was going on, trying to build a methodology around the, the idea of, of reaching for information. Uh, Ingo and Richard Back did all the good remote viewing. The rest of us were mediocre. The rest of us was uh, you know, the, the other researchers. We were at, at the level of a random distribution. And there was no difference between the double-blind experiments sealed in envelopes and the open ones. So the features that were best identified by the remote viewers were color and shape, relative weight. The presence of crystals was usually detected, as you saw in those two, two examples. The type of material, like metallic material. The process, like volcanic, was uh, often recognized. The errors were location. Nobody got the location. There was one rock that could only come, the europium, could only come from that particular mine in Death Valley. And we thought if somebody could nail that, that would really be interesting. And it was not, not found. And the uh, electromagnetic, the magnetite sample was not recognized as, as having electromagnetic properties. I don't know how that ties in with all the research that has been done since then and so on, but we did get some, some insights from, from, from that. Um, I went away from the program for many years. My uh, profession changed. I'm, I'm now a venture capitalist, so I still work with high-tech uh, companies, but in a, a different setting. But in the 80s, the, the program got new funding and a new, uh, and a new approach. And uh, at that point, uh, Hal and Ed May asked me to come back as a consultant, as a formal consultant to the program on a part-time basis under Grill Flame. So I was, I was then cleared for Grill Flame. And that's really the first time I really was part of the program. This was in the, the mid-'80s. Uh, so I was trained by, by Ingo. And observing what went on, and uh, let me say I'm a, I'm a lousy, I'm a mediocre remote viewer. And the, the argument has been made that everybody can be trained in remote viewing. And yeah, you could train me to play the cello, okay? But uh, we could, all of us could learn to play the, the cello, but Yo-Yo Ma would not be impressed, okay? Uh, to, to, to be yo yo ma, you have to have certain things first in your DNA, probably, and then you, you know, you probably have to, uh, you know, train yourself for ten hours a day for ten years before you get to the point of proficiency, and then you go on from there. And that's what people like Ingo, people like Richard, Richard Back has an, an amazing uh, ability. There are people with a native ability. There are people who can be trained and can become very good. Um, 
I got to the point where I could get sounds out of the cello. I mean, I, you, when you're, you're trained, you, know, you go through the training, you get it. You, you can see that, yes, there is something there. Uh, I remember uh, several instances with Ingo where I found myself at the top of a very, very high mountain. And uh, I, you know, I knew exactly what the environment was. And I knew I, you know, I experienced the vertigo. I experienced the, the drop. I experienced uh, all of that. So I've, I've had enough of those, those hits in, in the training to know that, yes, there is such a thing as remote viewing. And it can be learned. And it, it can be applied. But it also raises a lot of other questions. And by the way, the, the program we were part of was really the methodology side of the, of the development for remote viewing. And it's only recently that I've, I've met, I've had the opportunity to meet Paul and to read his book and to, to discover the other side that, that was actually in the application side. So I was never involved in the operational remote viewing. I was always on the methodology side and always SRI or SAIC. But in following the experiments, one of the big challenges that uh, I think exists that are, again, one of those pregnant questions that the scientific community should know about is what happens to time. Because just as remote viewing works well in space, it also works, seems to work pretty well if the targets are not today's targets, but the targets of tomorrow. Now, there is no, um, the model breaks down at that point. There is no physical model for uh, how you would address something in time. And um, the, the reason I, I didn't continue as a physicist, I was trained in astrophysics, and I love physics, and I was good at physics because I was good in math. So I could put the equations together, work through the equations, and get the, the answer. So I was passing those tests. But I never could really believe what they were teaching us about time. You know, that time is just another dimension. You know, and you, 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 you write IT, and then you treat it like X, Y, and Z, and then you do the equations, and it works. Because a dimension that goes only one way, you know, doesn't make any sense. It's not a dimension like the others. And no matter how you, you argue that in mathematically, mathematically it works elegantly, but it has no meaning. And I think the, the great contribution of parapsychology today could be in bringing out some of those, you know, some of those things to the attention of, of, um, of scientists in, in physics, theoretical physics, and in cosmology, and so on. There's a lot of discussion now about are there two dimensions of time? Are there, you know, is there an infinity of dimensions? Are there 11 dimensions? You know, the, uh, there are a, a, a num string theory. There are a number of theories that say the universe we perceive is a subset. It's a uh, condensation. It's a projection of a much larger universe with many, many more dimensions. In which case, it would make sense that there would be these coincidences and that there would be remote viewing. Next. So in, in terms of conclusions, and again, I'd like to turn this more into a, you know, an interaction uh, with you. I, I know you've, you've practiced this a lot more than I have, so I, I want to learn from you. But there were, the, going back to my memo and, and to the, the decision at SRI to do, to do research that was partly classified and partly open, I mean, there have been many open publications out of that whole program over the years from the beginning. Uh, what lessons can be drawn from that? Well, I think the participation of the three-letter agencies was a blessing and a curse. It was a blessing because this would never have been financed, not, certainly not at that level where it was financed for 25 years, if they had gone to NSF or to NASA or to an agency like RNIH, they would have been laughed out of the, the room. So the, it was a blessing that they could have an environment that was protected, where they could do research without necessarily having to publish everything all the time, and, and could do this tremendous development. It was a curse, because the, these agencies are mission-oriented. And they, they 
sort of took a simple-minded view of this as just another technology that works all the time. So they said, well, methodology is developed, now we go on, we apply it, and you know, here we go. And it wasn't ready. And they pushed it, and they pushed the program, and I, I saw that through all the conflicts in funding, and agencies fighting over the program, taking over one from the other. There were periods where nobody was paid for three months, and SRI was starting to look at, you know, uh, do we get rid of this thing, or what do we do with it, and so on. And uh, so they went through a tremendous, you know, tremendous turmoil, per including personal turmoil, in keeping the program running. And that damaged the research. Uh, certainly the, the research, I thought, should, should have been done. The, the addressing question, how does that information get there anyway? You know, this, uh, again, the, the simple question from a, any computer guy, how, how am I getting this information? Uh, what are the statistics and so on? That research could have been done, it has never been done. The research about time also hasn't been done because, in part because everybody recoiled in horror when they realized that uh, you, know, you couldn't necessarily pin down the targets in time. Uh, that opens up a lot of, of, of course, very, very interesting philosophical questions. The, so the expectations and the short-term mission-oriented results, that was unrealistic given the state of the methodology. And many of you may disagree with that based on you know, results, based on success with certain, uh, certain missions or certain things, but that certainly was my, my observation, that some fundamental avenues of research were never explored. That's the good news. I mean, there's still a lot of new things to be done. I mean, we're just at the beginning. And the, break, the unique breakthrough opportunity is, can this be used as a tool to explore the, uh, the nature of time? So that's essentially what I wanted to present as, a, uh, you know, as, an, as an introduction and as my, uh, my observations, again, as, a, as, a, as an outsider in, in those programs. And there were many, many, many other anecdotes that I didn't have time to, uh, to go into, but this gives you sort of an overview of, of my observation of it and, and some reminiscences from the early days. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we're going to take a few questions, right? Please, By the way, yeah. I want you to notice it's quiet. We finally figured out the solution, bribery. <laughs> the hotel, we had a huge fight with the manager. It was, it was ugly. Um, but he, he went over to try and get him to tone it down. And he finally came to a deal, we'll give you two hours of free bar if you turn the music off. And they said, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me just a second. I want to turn on these lights. Okay, they told me the lights are back here. I don't see them. That's better. Okay, good. Okay, so if you have a question for Jacques, we want you on the mic. Come on up here, please. Why don't you just say your name, too? Sure. Right. Jacques Vallée. My name is Stephen Hall from Altamont Springs, Florida. So glad to see you here. Uh, what an opportunity to ask you not only about uh, your interest in remote viewing, but uh, trying to connect that with your other interest, and that is in the whole area of UFOs as well, even though you didn't come here to talk about that. One of the things I've noticed, and I, I've come to these IRVA conferences ever since I think the first one, I guess in 2001, is when you catch some of the remote viewers in the hallway, um, and you talk with them about remote viewing, they will also talk about other anomalies, yes. and sometimes UFOs come up. Yes. So it seems like there's a bit of an overlap there of some sort. Um, John Mack, of course, a famous psychiatrist also, was very much involved in abduction research, and I think eventually he thought that uh, consciousness was very much involved in this. So, question. Um, can you tie those two together? Because I know at one time you were involved in the UFO community much more than perhaps you are now. You seem to move away from that and more into this investigation of how is consciousness related to this whole area of the matrix of reality? That would be number one, and I can't let this go. 
Could you comment about the French Comita report, which I thought was just fantastic and yet didn't make a dent in Western media? Okay, those are two very different questions. In, um, well, one reason I was close to the SRI research at the beginning was that um, they noticed that many of their subjects related their, you know, becoming aware of their talent to a light in the sky or to what you, we would call a UFO incident. Uh, I've, I've investigated a lot of, you know, I, I like, I'm, I'm still involved in UFO research. And, but I, I stay away from all the controversies because it's turned into a circus and into a battle of belief systems where nobody goes out and talks to witnesses anymore because they don't need to. You know, they expect that either the government has you know, little cadavers in the cave somewhere and they won't tell us. So you can speculate on that. You can stay in your living room and speculate on that. Or they believe whatever they believe and they believe it so strongly that they don't need to talk to witnesses anymore. Well, I like to talk to witnesses because they were there and I wasn't. And I take the time to listen to them. I track those cases over months or years. And uh, you know, I, I want to, to learn what happens in the process. It's a process. It's not an observation. It's not a point thing. And it's not like seeing a shooting star and saying, I saw a shooting star at, at 10 o'clock. It's, it's a process. In that process, many of the percipients, many of the observers um, will describe what can only be called psychic effects. And ufologists deny that. Most ufologists will deny that. They say, you know, these are spacecraft from another planet. They come here, they study us. You know, end of story. Uh, it, it's not that simple. So uh, I, I've learned to, for example, to ask uh, witnesses, uh, tell me, they say, well, this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. I say, well, what, what had, any, had anything strange happened before? And they say, well, no, uh, except that the phone rang and there was nobody on the phone, or there was a knock at the door and went to open the door, there was nobody there, or, you know, or I've uh, I'd become aware of certain things and so on. Before the, the sighting. So there, there is a continuity there. Again, there is a process. So you can't ignore consciousness when you're looking at, at that. Is there a link? Can remote viewing be used in UFO research? I've seen many attempts, and I was at SRI when. Pat Price was at SRI, came up with a set of coordinates where he thought they were UFO bases. Uh, we've actually looked at some of those locations. We, we couldn't validate any of that. Um, so m most of those attempts have been failures. That doesn't mean that they couldn't you know, give something at some point. Uh, I think the remote viewing of UFO sites usually has not you know, led to, uh, to, to very much. Uh, again, that's an open area as far as I'm concerned. I don't consider myself an expert. Ingo remote viewed uh, structures on the moon. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, yeah, uh, I've uh, had a long discussion with him about that, and I, I can't make sense out of that. Um, the, uh, I mean, we, you know, the, the moon is fairly well mapped by, by now, and I, I know, uh, you know, three of the twelve people who worked on the moon, you know, are colleagues of, of ours, and so on. So. Um, including Ed Mitchell, who strongly, you know, is a strong advocate of this kind of research and, and remote viewing research. So, it's, so uh, I don't understand that, that connection. But now, the the Cometa report is um, the the reason it hasn't had the the impact. The the I, I should I should explain what Cometa is. It's it's a there is an organization in, in France which is a, uh, essentially an advanced war college with senior defense officials, usually many of them retired generals and admirals and so on from the French, French military. And they, they study long-term strategic issues, uh, very much like the war college here or uh, some, uh, George Washington University does and so on. And the, uh, a group of them issued a report a few years ago arguing that UFOs should be taken seriously. The, the report is, uh, was published in a tabloid magazine 
250,000 copies hit the street as a report to the French government, to the president of France, on UFOs. Uh, well, the president of France hadn't asked for a report. Now, I can write a report to the president of uh, you know, Tasmania and send it to him. That doesn't mean he's paying me to do this. It doesn't. So there was that feeling. So there was a big impact among believers about people said, no, finally, those military higher ups are taking an interest in it, which was true. But I think they lost the impact by hyping it out of proportion. The, the, the report had the, on the cover a, a picture of a, of a disc over a lake in Costa Rica. Um, well, I brought that picture back from Costa Rica, and there was no credit given to me, which you know, I, I didn't need credit, but to the people who had taken the picture and had given me the negative, because we had digitized the negative and the picture before and the picture after. This was a mapping aircraft picture. And these were big negatives, 11 centimeter by 11 centimeter, great camera, a lot of detail. There were a lot of things to be said about that. It's not necessarily a UFO. But that was on the cover as, you know, from the archives of Mr. So-and-so, who was the journalist who put this together. So the, the whole thing stank. Furthermore, the, most of the report is very factual. It's a good description. Of, it's something that any one of us would have, would have written a good description of the, the UFO problem. The last page, which most of the authors of the report had not seen when they signed their name and then they wrote the introduction, uh, General Letty, who wrote the introduction, had not seen the whole report when he wrote the introduction. And they actually threatened to withdraw their name from it. The last page was written by someone whose name has never been mentioned is someone who is in the shadows in France and has manipulated the situation for his own reasons. And it argues that uh, the US has recovered hardware at Roswell. Uh, and he presents it as, you know, in the context of, an of, of what seems to be an official report of the French military, and that the uh, Americans are not sharing that information with their friends in France. So it's very much in an anti-American context, you know, which is very much a political context in France now. And it's driven by an undercurrent that's really, if you understand French politics, which is hard to understand, but um, it's, it's driven from the extreme right. A lot of, some of the associated people are in fact associated with the Front National, which is one of the so it was not well received in France because people said, hey, you know, part of this report, we already know and believe there is a UFO phenomenon, and yeah, it should be looked at. But, you know, what's this other thing? I mean, do you have a proof about Roswell? Are you, you know, if there is a proof, we'd like, you know, show it. In, in an, uh, it, what's an official report at that level? You can't just suggest that somebody has something unless you have data. And that may or may not be true, but there was no data. So uh, that's, I think, why it was not well received in France and why it was received skeptically by the press here as well. Because they, you know, any New York Times would, would pick up the phone, call somebody at the Elysee Palace and say, did you request a report on UFOs? And they would say, never heard of these guys. And so that's the end of the story. So it was a missed opportunity. The, uh, the people who wrote most of the report are good people. They are, you know, uh, uh, certainly high, you know, very high level military officers. And I think that whole thing was a missed opportunity to advance the, the cause of, uh, of the research. Oh. Hi, great, great presentation. Uh, Inga Swan asked me to give you his best regards. And Thank you. I did it. My question is who now in the world has the best idea of what time is and whether you can change it? Uh, I'm not in that field. Uh, I read um, New Scientist, and I, you know, I try to, to stay re relatively current. It seems that with every issue of New Scientist, there is a new theory of, you know, of everything, a uh, new theory of how many dimensions there are, a new theory of the latest issue has a very interesting theory about two dimensions of time. Uh, rather than one, and, and saying that our four-dimensional universe that we perceive 
is really a projection of, of at least a six-dimensional or more dimensional universe. Um, again, I, I think that remote viewing is one of the tools that could be used to uh, bring us some insight into that. One of the things is that when you precog something and have it see it happen later on, say 45 days or years later, you ask yourself, what if I had changed something? And that's the question that's not answered. Yes. Well, the, it's a challenge also at, at, at the technical level for uh, judging because, you know, if, if you can do precognition of the final report, uh, you're not a real independent judge, are you? So, uh, I mean, you have to, if you assume that you can do precognition, um, I mean, the, the people who are describing those, those works could have been doing precognition of what we're doing here today with this presentation. So, all the rocks could be doing the experiment and, and we're just part of their experiment. So, Hi, Teresa Frisch from Troy, Ohio. Thank you for coming to see us today and sharing. Um, I was wondering, you had mentioned in your presentation, uh, could you give us the current thoughts on third generation net artificial intelligence and consciousness? Any progress being made? <laughs> Just a question, you know. Well, thank you. It, um, I think the, the, the breakthroughs will come from um, you know, artificial intelligence is always a question of, of definitions. You know, and in the 50s, people said, well, you know, if we could have a, a computer that would uh, play chess better than a human champion, that would be artificial intelligence. So you make a computer and that beats the champion, and, and now people say, no, 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 that's not real artificial intelligence. It would have to do these other things. And so you, you keep pushing the, the envelope. You, can pushing the def you keep pushing the definitions. I think we're a long way from uh, having machine intelligence, but once it happens, I mean, a long way, maybe you know, 50 years. The, uh, I was taught a lesson one day. I was giving a presentation on artificial intelligence at, at Princeton at the RCA labs, and there was, um, and I was talking about artificial intelligence in, in terms of understanding databases, you know, looking at the structure of databases and extracting information from it automatically. And there was a, a senior scientist who took me aside and we went to his lab. And he said, you're making the same mistake that everybody in artificial intelligence is making. And I said, well, you know, what's, what's that? And he said, the mistake is that you're looking at human intelligence as a guideline. And he said, that's a, that's a big mistake in engineering. Uh, if you want to build a 747, you don't look at birds. You, you, know, you start with, you take a barn door, you put a big engine on it, and that flies. Okay? And then you go on from there and you build it. Nature never developed the 747 because it wouldn't have anything to eat. And he said, <laughs> said similarly, similarly, Nature has never developed an intelligent being because it has never needed it. So if you look at human intelligence as a guideline for engineering true intelligence, you're making a big mistake. So what he was saying is the moment, there will be a time when we have a machine that's as, you know, as intelligent by certain criteria you know, as humans, then the next day there will be a machine that will be a million times more intelligent. And then... Uh, I don't know what happens to us. And that may not happen out of computer technology. It may happen out of uh, uh, molecular biology, you know, out of, of genetics, genomics, and so on. So I think that's more likely to happen faster out of genomics than, than out of computer technology, although the two are getting to the same scale right now. So that, that's not something to look forward to. <laughs> it's not playing chess anymore. Hi, I'm Cynthia Tompkins. I'm the secretary of IRVA, 
And I don't know, I'm very honored to have you here and so excited, but I don't know whether to thank you for the internet or for your work in remote viewing. I mean, equally <laughs> excited about both, but. But well, my role in the internet was very, you know. There I were, know, I, I at heard. At one time, there were 20 principal investigators. I was one of them. And we were very focused on, on the conferencing aspect. Well, Everybody I'm, hated us because we were stealing computer cycles from the people who wanted to do real computing. I've also looked at your books that you've written in computer science, so all of those are quite impressive too, and exciting. Um, you mentioned the concept of time as something that we could look into, and of course that's very exciting. Uh, Courtney Brown gave a great uh, presentation earlier, and uh, his excitement for science was equally good. As a venture capitalist, can you, you also talked about different experiments that we could get into, and I wanted you to elaborate on that if you could. And as a venture capitalist, do you see any of those experiments uh, providing, of course, one set up the right parameters that any venture capitalist might be interested in? Well, um, thank you. Venture capital is fairly focused on, um, venture capital doesn't finance technology, finances management teams, you know, management is, technology is all over the place. Uh, the, the, the key is really you know, well-motivated business teams that can manage an invention and, and find the right market and position it right and create an enterprise. So that's what venture capitalists look for. Now, having said that, they're all, you know, in love with technology and new ideas, new high-tech uh, things and so on. Uh, but when you look at the, the great companies that have been built during the internet bubble, you know, uh, eBay, uh, Microsoft, uh, and so on, they are all today run by CEOs out of Procter & Gamble, okay, who are brand managers. Okay. Uh, they are not run by computer guys. Um, the, uh, that includes Amazon, eBay, Microsoft, and a bunch of others. All of them out of P&G. Okay. Um, so th before re remote viewing, uh, I think it's, it's still too much of a, of a research, you know, uh, research activity before it could be funded, you know, through, uh, a as a company that could. That doesn't mean that it couldn't you couldn't start companies that would be service companies to people in technology, uh, sort of exploring, exploring certain directions. Just as you, know, you, would, you would hire uh, experts in certain areas to validate a particular technology idea in, in a venture-backed uh, company. Yeah, so there, there is a role there. Definitely. Now, what other experiments? Um, I, I would have to think about that. I, it doesn't uh, jump out at me. Certainly, it, it would be worth uh, redoing our network experiments. It would be a lot easier to do it now with the web. I remember we, this was 1975, okay? Uh, so the, we were doing web 2.0 in 1975 on the ARPANET. Um, to redo the one one reason I picked rocks is that rocks have economic value. I mean, some of those rocks. I mean, some of that was gold or, you know, opals, uh, precious things, europium, and so on. Those are. If you could extend that, I thought if it works, then we'll have the attention of, of uh, some industrial people. Yes, if you could locate. I know. Unfortunately, the failures had to do with not detecting electromagnetic properties. But again, this was more anecdotal. I mean, we only had you know, a small series of samples. Uh, but it would be worth redoing it seriously. And my, my concern with a lot of the parapsychology experiments is that, well, if, if the experiment succeeds, so what? I mean, so you've remote viewed you know, the Eiffel Tower. Well, we already know where the Eiffel Tower is. I'd much rather remote view you know, a unique mine in Death Valley that has, you know, can can corner the world market in Europium or something like that, because we need more Europium. I think we're going to have to probably, maybe this will be the last question. Okay. So let's see. Harold Harrison. Uh, 
it, it goes back to the artificial intelligence and for the broader issue of remote viewing, uh, I propose a new test instead of the Turing test, which I think the most recent one was that if you had a conversation with one, you couldn't differentiate whether or not it was a machine or a person. But within and with respect to remote viewing, and particularly what uh, Courtney talked about this afternoon, if you can no longer rely on the machine to do the random test because it has the intent that alters the results, you now have something that's beyond a machine. Yes, that's true. No, I <laughs> okay. agree with that. Well, as you can tell, having a two-hour free bar has its own liabilities. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, we really appreciate uh, Jacques' presentation. It was very enlightening. I wish I could have heard more of it. <laughs> but nonetheless, the rest of you, I think, probably enjoyed it. So uh, perhaps another round of applause.